SRA 421, Session 1.3.1 Intelligence and Policy The U.S. National Security Policy Process In 1.3, we will be examining the interplay between intelligence, intelligence activities and operations, and policy. In 1.3.1, we will look at the U.S. policymaking process generally, then focus a bit on U.S. national security policy, and finally look at the uh, question of policy dynamics and the role of the intelligence community. Note that while, as we have uh, stated, intelligence operations are carried out by a variety of types of organizations, in this session, on policy. We'll be focusing primarily on intelligence activities on the part of governments, in particular the United States government. We'll also introduce the intelligence community in the, of the United States, although we will have a much more in-depth look at the IC in Unit 2. Generally, intelligence is and should be closely linked to policy, but in some ways the relationship is quite complex, as we will see. Let's begin with a look at the U.S. policymaking process generally. In the United States, policy formulation involves a number of overlapping domains that at times uh, create some tension. There is the issue of Congress versus the courts, laws passed by Congress that are at times declared unconstitutional, court decisions that Congress does not like, uh, and in response to which Congress passes an additional legislation. We've seen that in a number of instances there is potential or real tension between Congress and the executive. This type of tension ideally results in correctives, the concept of checks and balances. And these correctives also apply to a certain degree to those portions of the policymaking process that deal with national security and intelligence policies. The way in which intelligence policies are formulated in the United States is through something called the interagency process, which is precisely what it sounds like the coordination and interaction of the various agencies that are tasked with intelligence activities and operations. As we will see, intelligence, collection, analysis, etc., can provide very useful information to policymakers. And indeed, one of the key ingredients in the policymaking process is information. And intelligence is, in essence, information. Information of a certain type, but nonetheless, information. It should be clear, then, that intelligence is closely connected to policy. In fact, intelligence is most effective both analytically and operationally when it is linked closely to clearly understood and widely shared policy goals. One of the main tasks of intelligence and the intelligence community is to inform policymakers. Policymakers are the recipients of intelligence, but they also in certain ways can shape it. Obviously policymakers do not actually generate intelligence. However, by setting policy-related intelligence requirements, giving direction to the intelligence community about the types of things that should be collected and analyzed, policymakers can affect what intelligence is actually targeted and what final or finished intelligence ultimately results. Note that while policy and policy goals focus the direction of intelligence priorities in the way just described, the results of intelligence collection and analysis can in turn have an impact on aspects of policy. This happens when policymakers react and respond to intelligence product uh, with which they are presented. And, and then give new policy directives based on the inputs of that intelligence. The extent to which intelligence can and should affect policy is controversial, 
however, as we will uh, see below. One point to note at the outset is that U.S. intelligence policy over the decades since the Cold War, and even before, has been characterized by a high degree of continuity. Throughout most of the Cold War era, there was no significant partisan political differences. In fact, during the Cold War, there was a broad consensus on the policy of containment that really transcended uh, elements of partisanship. During the Vietnam War, uh, there was a little bit more rhetorical sparring, but really very little substantive differences. In fact, while intelligence and intelligence policy has at times been manipulated for partisan, political, or other purposes, as we will examine later, by and large, the basic contours of U.S. intelligence policy have not and do not change with changing administrations. While the two parties sometimes differ on approaches, the core of U.S. intelligence policy remains fairly constant. This is indeed still true today. When we say intelligence is linked to policy, we mostly mean what is broadly called national security policy. This includes defense policy, foreign and homeland security policy, and so on. While valuable intelligence may affect other national policies, usually the intelligence stakes are the highest with respect to national security. Current U.S. law defines all intelligence as so-called national intelligence. This includes foreign, domestic, as well as homeland security-related intelligence. U.S. national security policy is broadly outlined in what's uh, called the U.S. national security strategy. As we will see over the course of the semester, the United States has a number of different national strategies. The national security strategy stresses the need to integrate intelligence, counterintelligence, and homeland security policies and programs within the context of overall national security policy and uh, goals and priorities. The strategy makes clear that intelligence and counterintelligence capabilities need to evolve continuously to identify and characterize a number of conventional and what are called asymmetric threats and to provide timely insight about those. There is a strong emphasis on strengthening partnerships with foreign intelligence services and sustaining strong ties with close allies. We will take a closer look at the intelligence and counterintelligence strategies of the United States because there is also a U.S. counterintelligence strategy. Uh, later in the semester. Let's take a quick look at the U.S. national security policy process generally. There are five main centers of U.S. national security. The President of the United States, certain cabinet-level departments, the Department of State, the Department of Defense, the Department of Commerce, Treasury Department, and the Department of Homeland Security, to name a few, the staff of the National Security Council, which really function as the hub of the system, the rest of the intelligence community as a whole, and finally Congress, in its role as uh, the body that controls expenditures, formulates some policy in its own right, and certainly conducts oversight. The inputs and policies of the main players are in large measure determined by their varying interests, which they have. Of course, the main interest of all of the players is to keep the country secure, to further and promote a variety of U.S. national and national security objectives, and so on. But apart from that, there are some differences. Presidents, for example, are transient, eight years at the most, often concerned with broad policy initiatives. Indeed, we've seen that the extent to which a given president will focus on intelligence and intelligence operations will depend in large part on that president's personality, 
also may be driven by what's going on in the world at the time. The U.S. Department of State largely focuses on foreign policy, seeking to advance policy interests through diplomacy. The State Department uses intelligence to support foreign policy objectives, specific diplomatic initiatives, negotiating stances, and so on. The Defense Department is obviously concerned with uh, def national defense, primarily with maintaining a military capability that is sufficient or more than sufficient to deter any and all foreseeable threats. Obviously, there are often multiple and shared interests, but each of the players sometimes has some variation. Other agencies that may, in fact, do have varying interests include Homeland Security, which has a primary focus on preventing terrorist attacks against or in the U.S. homeland. As we will see in Unit 2, DHS also plays a key role in coordinating a number of component agencies, as well as having the lead in terms of coordination with a variety of state and local law enforcement authorities. We will see that since its creation in 2002, or late 2001, the Department of Homeland Security has steadily grown in power and influence. The National Security Council staff, not the Secretaries of State and Defense, but the actual mid-level staff workers who form the backbone of the national security, they're primarily interested in the execution of policy as defined by the President and other senior officials. These are the individuals who are tasked with coordination of intelligence and other policies. One of their jobs is to translate broad policy priorities and directives into specific actions. The key element by which this takes place is called the interagency process. Essentially, it is a consensus-based coordination among any and all interested agencies with respect to a given issue. The emphasis is on bargaining and negotiation. There are no real coercive measures available. Of course, the president is the ultimate arbiter, but may be reluctant to step in actively. Not surprisingly, given the variety of agency interests and priorities that exist, a certain inertia can result with respect to contentious or controversial issues. We will consider this and other themes related to this as we go through the remainder of the semester.